Good afternoon and welcome to the Firaxis live stream. I'm Pete Murray, uh, joined today by Ed Beach, uh, lead designer of Civ 6 Gathering Storm, and Brian Feltes, Civ 6 Gathering Storm gameplay designer. And guys, we are here today to talk about the Ottoman Empire and yes. their inclusion in Gathering Storm. This is one that the fans have been waiting a long time for. And, and I've actually been waiting on this one because I, I, I've done a number of games with the Ottomans included in them. Mm -hmm. now, always a huge fan of anything 16th century European type of history. Um, and I, I worked on the Ottomans in Civ V, mm -hmm. and um, Civ V was a little bit tougher to kind of bring all the possible elements of glory that, that need to be in a civilization in. We didn't have quite as many abilities to play with. Uh, the Ottomans had two unique um, units in that one, so that sort of took up a lot of their slots in terms of what unique abilities they had. So I kind of, in Civ Six, I wanted to wait and make sure that we had all the tools in our arsenal to make a really amazing Ottoman um, side to play. And so here we have Barbary Corsairs, we have Janissaries, we have Suleiman, we have Suleiman's boyhood friend Ibrahim Pasha as his Grand Vizier. Um, we have the Grand Bazaar, so it's just fully featured, just the Ottoman Civ just the way I want it to be. It's definitely worth the wait, Yes. I think. Yeah, we were talking yesterday, uh, practicing for the stream, all the cool stuff that you could potentially do with the Ottoman. And so we're going to show it off to you today, how they are in Civilization VI. So let's go ahead and we're going to jump in our game, and driving our game today is Carl, Scourge of Nations, Salter Fields, Despoiler of Cities, Bringer of Lamentations. Driving a Civ that he's going to be very comfortable using the very conquest-focused Ottoman Empire here. So. Uh, Ed, you want to kind of talk about what their suite of abilities gets us? Okay, and I'll also sort of give the background of the game a little bit as sure. well, because I, I started this game and then handed it over to Carl. Once we got close to military action, I wanted to make sure we had our best commander in the field. So, <laughs> so Carl uh, yes. has been prepping for our military onslaught. Now, we set up this game like we have been setting up the recent um, streams where we put in all the civs that we've announced previously for Gathering Storm, so there are our opponents. Uh, we had one slot left, and we thought, well, who's a you know historical enemy of the Ottomans? How about Philip II Spain? So they're in our game as well. And we then just sort of let it play out to just sort of see who was going to be our antagonist in this game and who might be friendly. Yep. Um, so we'll note that uh, if we take a look at the map, that we're kind of um, sandwiched between the Mali Empire to our west, and then, um, although the Incans are nearby us, they're sort of separated by mountains and lakes, so we can't really directly go against them. Uh, but off to our northeast are the Hungarians. Mm -hmm. And the Hungarian Empire has done amazingly well in this game. Um, if we want to quickly look at the scores, we can see how their score is... Yeah, they're out of Yeah, they're, they're kind there. of running away with they're it. They're running away with it, and they're, they basically have double our score. Right. So... Um, you know, this is the time we're about to enter um, the kind of glory period for the Ottomans. Um, so we're in the Renaissance, and this is when we have to make our push. Okay. And so up until now, we were sort of playing a, a relatively vanilla sieve, but we get all our bonuses stacked in this type of part of the game. Um, so we have to decide if we're going to win this game, we have to go against somebody, and obviously it's looking like Hungary. But... We're friendly with them right now. We have a declaration of yes. friendship. Yes, so what, what happened was <laughs> so that, <laughs> I, I, I was looking at Molly and Hungary, and I was knowing I had to attack one of them or the other. Mm -hmm. And Hungary came across really friendly, and um, I accepted his declaration of friendship. And I could not set myself up to get Mansa Musa to like me at all. Um, so what I ended up having to do was um, go with that and like keep the pressure off. So I made the friends with Hungary, but I you know, decided I'm gonna send out missionaries to both of those civilizations. I have the crusader belief. So we're gonna get combat bonuses near any city that follows Islam. Okay. Um, and then it was just a matter of, well, how does this all play out? And Molly's score is down where we are. And so he's not really the person we need to be making up we ground need, against. All, all eyes are right. on the, So I decided, you know, I, I think our declaration, we actually had a declaration of friendship with Matthias mm -hmm. recently, but we, that has gone ahead. We've let that lapse so that we can start prepping for war against him because we're now just in, in the friendly state. Well, uh, it's it actually looks like he's massing some military units up there too. I mean, this is, this is somewhat concerning. I see some black army units. I see some 
um, somewhat anachronistic chariots that are moving around up there too. But um, it's clear that that if his score is that far ahead, he probably has a has a pretty sizable military going as well for this. So um, got a couple of questions uh, that have come through us about Ibrahim specifically. Great. So um, people kind of want to know how he works. You know, this is an interesting governor with some interesting abilities going with him. You want to uh, talk about well, it a little bit? Yeah, sure. Like we, I think we really wanted him to be special um, because he's like the first Civ unique governor um, we've ever put in the game. And so, you know, just to have him kind of be an amalgamation of all the other ones or slightly different wasn't wasn't good enough. So he had to be very, very special. So one of the first, one of the biggest things is that not only can he be placed in any of your own cities, he can be placed in city-states just like Amani the diplomat. But in addition to that, we've extended it to where you can put him in uh, any city uh, of a foreign, uh, the capital of a foreign civ, as mm -hmm. long as you're not at war with them. Okay, well, can we bring up his uh, his promotions real quick so we can take a look at some of those? And then, Ed, you actually have an interesting naming convention for these as well, too. You want to yeah, talk about that? Yeah, the cool thing about the way these were designed is they're set up so that each of the abilities here you know, sort of rep represents what he was good at in real life. So he was not only the leader of Suleiman's uh, military campaigns and also his provincial governor helping put down revolts in Egypt and uh, fighting against the Persians and so forth, but he actually moved up in the ranks of the Ottoman hierarchy steadily over the time that he was uh, part of the power structure there. He was promoted, so to speak. <laughs> yes, promoted over and over again. Yes, so it's like kind of convenient here, yes. So, you know, that was why we thought he was such a great example for our mm -hmm. first unique governor was because we could look at the history, we could tie in the history, we could come up with promotions that actually made sense because they were actually the names of titles that he held um, on his way working up the ranks. And it's actually really interesting because Grand Vizier, which is the final title here, he, he actually did not want to be given that title. Yeah, that was his final title, but he did not want to be so engaged in all the politic at that point because he would have been a key player once you're Grand Vizier. Right, so, he knew that everyone was going to be gunning for mm -hmm, him yep. and that there would be all sorts of rivals who would develop. And Suleiman insisted, it's going to be fine, it's going to be fine. It turned out it wasn't. Yeah. But. Oh well. It's fine, you're, we're bros, I got your back. <laughs> it's, yeah. It's, if, you, if you don't know the story of Ibrahim and Suleiman, it's very much worth a read, even if it's just a quick one on a Wikipedia page. You'll yeah. find up some really and cool we may, stuff. We may devolve into some Ottoman sure, stories. Sure, yeah, we, we, might, we might have some But we want to nice get into the game Ottoman, a little bit first. Yeah, no Anecdotes, doubt. this play, but let's get moving. So, um, sorry, uh, people have some other questions about Ibrahim, and as we get along, maybe we'll, we'll, we'll cover them a little bit. So I, I think it's very interesting in this game, for whatever reason, you couldn't get um, going on friendly terms with Mali. They, in, traditionally, every time I played with them, you just send them a couple of trade routes and- Every time that, I play them, everybody loves me yeah. because they're, they're trading with me, they're making tons of money, and I'm, I'm making tons of money, so it's, it's, I find it interesting and, too. And they hadn't started a religion, so it wasn't a religious rivalry that yeah. was the problem. Um, uh, we, we had, Mount Everest right near our start location here, which is great for, for religion. Starting religion, yeah. Yeah, so I kind of decided um, uh, Islam could also be a part of our military conquest strategy, so um, in ter with the with the right beliefs um, set up for it. So I just, I just went ahead with that plan, um, but hung Hungary was sort of friendly out of the gate. And yeah. It wasn't. We also have the, uh, didn't you say that we have the natural disasters Oh yeah, all the way, or the yes, they are. So you're going to see a lot of natural up. disasters in so today's this, stream. This so volcanic eruption. We just saw one. We, like we ma I maxed this out when I set up the game just to increase live stream drama. Sure. So I mean, as we were testing yesterday, for example, we had a drought blow through. Um, droughts will pillage farms and pastures in the area that they're in. They will not convert tiles to desert, but they will certainly impede your ability to get food going in uh, in your cities. So I guess I'm going along with, um, you know, I, I think you said you had some people asking some questions about Ibrahim. I think we can um, we can kind of go into sort of the basic design philosophy of his promotion tree. Sure, yeah. Um, and, and of course, where we usually start with these things, or we like to start, which gives us a lot of good inspiration, is we like to start with the history of it. And as Ed already kind of touched on it, all the different levels and promotions that he had um, through time. But he was, he was an excellent military commander. Um, often fighting alongside Suleiman, commanding a whole separate set of troops and things like that, and, and they're very successful in their conquests. But he was also an amazing diplomat as well. So 
with those two things in mind, um, that was kind of the inspiration to be able to send him to another sieve, to a major sieve's capital, and um, and so the benefits that are get, that you get are mutual in that respect. So we ha- kind of had sort of that we've done with some of the other governors, kind of two separate lines to the to the promotion tree, so to speak. So like one of a more militaristic sense, and another one um, good for strengthening alliances and such. And, I, and we can later on, I think we can go and look at those exact things in his uh, promotion tree in a little more detail later. But um, just wanted to kind of give a general overview of what, what our what our uh, design philosophy was. Right, yeah. and there's some detailed questions that we know we're going to be answering <clears throat> yep. about how some of these things work. And we can, sure. we've can we actually um, thought about a lot of these things and they actually tie into the history really well. Um, I love how we just had a flood in the yeah. Hungarian Empire um, because not only does it damage one of the border cities that we might be going up against, um, so it's not going to be at full uh, defensive strength, uh, but if people look carefully, there were also some floating icons coming up showing the new fertility added. That was like one of the little polish enhancements that we put in the game recently just to kind of make it very clear to players um, that yes, their tiles are get, becoming stronger and uh, kind of give you an idea of exactly where that happened. Mm-hmm. Uh, somebody in chat wants to know if you can target Ibrahim in your capital as if he were an enemy governor using the neutralized governor, uh, neutralized governor attack. I can't say I've ever tried that. Um, you almost wouldn't want to. I mean, you're going to be getting yeah. a lot of advantages yeah, from having so, there. So, so let's think about what, uh, and we'll go into the history a little sure. bit here as well. So Ibrahim has the ability to go into enemy capitals because typically he goes into capitals um, to try to either improve the friendliness there yes. or to help out that friendly nation. So. Um, he does have a promotion that reduces grievances with that particular mm-hmm. nation, um, but in general, um, he also, you know, has one of his early promotions helps military production there, and that actually applies to whatever sieve to whatever sieve he's, he's in. He's in, and so, oh uh, boy. Yeah, I was I, I was just watching. We, um, we're talking about <laughs> we're this. Have to in, in, uh, interrupt our uh, history lesson here and uh, get back to the game because Matthias just declared a surprise war against us. Mm-hmm. Okay, so he was obviously thinking the same li- along the same lines we were that it was time to get down and dirty. He's got the Black Army online. Um, luckily, I noticed that Carl did put Ibrahim in our border city here, and it looks like it's one turn until he is active with his um, bonuses. Which will be good, because we'll need it at that point. Yeah, so we should have, um, not in that city, but if we're attacking in the Hungarian city, we should have the Crusade bonus um, in that city, we should ha- anywhere within the tile range, we should mm-hmm. be getting Ibrahim's bonus. Yep. Um, and uh, you know, so we'll have to kind of take advantage of all those things. Well, to fight because I'm not sure we were really quite prepared to fight just yet. We yeah, do not we've only have got... a Janissary um, online yet. Um, mm-hmm. yeah. or one Hungary turn has their one unique. Turn away from Hungary's there. got their unique yeah. unit. We do not yet have ours. So. Uh, yeah, yeah and one of the other things, it be, was, especially with city sieges and things like that, is it's it's important to get niter as quickly as possible for your Janissaries. Right, and it, that's a key sort of bottleneck for the Ottomans as well, because they want to get their catapults upgraded to Mombards. Yep, and you need niter for that as well. So we're a little short on the niter here, but we'll have to see if Carl can pull us through. Well, uh, Carl was doing something very clever during during yesterday's test, where he was he was managing upgrades very cleanly. So I think he's planning to use his uh, swordsman upgrade them into janissaries because uh, upgrading a swordsman into a janissary will not cost a population, whereas recruiting one fresh will. So he's kind of going to kind of be able to get his household troops up in order fairly quickly, and then by strategically micromanaging his niter resources, it's going to be. Uh, yeah, he's going to yeah, do some a, clever things. It, it, we'll it, yeah, it's a little bit of a, you, there's a little bit of finagling that needs to be done there because basically, if you do not have enough resources in order to produce a certain unit, then it still keeps the previous unit unlocked so that you're still able to build that even Correct. if you can't build the one that demands resources. It, you really want so to. through some creative gameplay, Carl was taking advantage of this and um, basically building the previous unit and then going and upgrading it so that he did not lose a pop. So, so we're just looking at there. him. Yes. Yeah, yeah. so I 
think we had a... In the Saraskar promotion, that was his title when he was fighting against Persia historically, right. and that is um, the one that lets his combat bonus project out from the city that he's in. Um, Which is going to be very, very useful here, making him almost like Victor in terms yeah, of his ability to support that. Yeah, it's only against districts, so uh, we're going to have to first defeat the Hungarian army in the field before we make the final push on the other cities, but that along with the extra bombard strength mm -hmm. um, makes the Ottomans really, really good at taking down cities. So even our catapults, which are um, uh, nominally not as powerful as bombards, are going to be pretty effective here uh, when, when they start attacking. They're not these fancy, ornate Turkish bombards. Yet. We'll get right. Yet. Right. Yet. Yet. Well, we were talking about that, right? Like, you know, about how it'd be so easy to make so many unique units for the Ottomans in addition to the Janissary and... And, and the Barbary uh, Corsair, the, the Barbary which is Corsair, coming correct. along as well. So yep. that was one of the ones, too. It was like, oh, God, wouldn't well, it be cool if they had a unique bombard, you know? But 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 to be fair, we did model the bombard, like, visually after yeah. the famous Turkish bombards, so from, from history. Kind of had that covered. Mm -hmm. Yep. So um, Carl's going to be kind of fighting this two-front war. So there's there's kind of four cities involved here. Halep down in the lower left. Um Amasya, right there, and Miskolsh and Kolsavar um, up there. That yeah, he's gonna either be... that or Abuda. I'm not sure which one. Oh, okay. Abuda has um, quite a few wonders in it, so taking that city would be nice. Oh, We've taking Chichenitsa. Chichenitsa and um, Angkor Wat. Angkor Wat, yeah. yeah. Plus, we don't really have to worry about our left flank too much. Um, we have that nice strategically placed encampment right at that choke point to really help defend from any attacks coming from that way. So yeah, the obvious choice is to go straight after the the city with the uh, with all those juicy wonders. Yeah, and I love I love the map here because there are these lakes along our border, and whoever controls this border region is going to be able to set up a massive canal network. Massive later. chain of canals out to yeah, the ocean. Later in the game. So now that we have gunpowder, uh, this is when this is when the Janissaries start getting really interesting. So. Um, We've created our first. We've created our first one that's going to yes. help our air score considerably. And now, actually, we're going to be in position to go into a golden era for the next stage when we when we transition through, which will be very useful for us. I think we're in great shape. We're the Ottomans. Nobody's going to stop us. Okay, it looks costing us seven nighter per upgrade. So, yes. um, you know, as long as we keep it. Uh, some swordsmen in the pipeline will be able to, you know, continue to use the build the swordsmen and then upgrade them into Janissary's uh, strategy. So there are definitely a bunch of ways to um, work with the Ottomans. Mm -hmm. In this particular game, um, and, and normally the way I like to play them is I like to conquer a few cities early, even though you don't have bonuses then, just to right. give yourself a base to recruit Janissary's, especially if you can get a high production city. Then I'll build an encampment there and use those to kind of... Um, be like a little Janissary... Uh, factory. Factory, <laughs> yeah. 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 Uh, but that didn't really happen in this game. We were sort of behind this mountain range. Everything was a little peaceful. We had plenty of um, territory to exp expand in. But, you know, that, that doesn't really hurt you. You've got ways to get your Janissary if you need them. So uh, when I was, you know, skimming through the forums uh, yesterday, today, um, I was kind of getting the impression there still might be some questions about how the, the new strategic resource system works in, in Gathering Storm. I know we've touched on it before, and you, you talked about it. I think right here the cost uh, for upgrading is uh, um, seven uh, gunpowder to, to do so. Um, those costs scale with game speed, obviously, So, um, um, but there is a like a base cost, basically, that you pay for each unit, and... Um, that, but but that mechanic shifts a little bit. It goes from sort of a an upfront cost that you pay when you produce when you first apply production to that unit um, to later on to kind of what we call the fuel model, um, where your units actually consume resources per turn, almost almost as like a maintenance. So when you get into oil and uh, coal, your units start consuming these resources per turn, uh, much in the same way that the power is generated in the game, things like that. Right, and that really starts to kick in sort of on the. Naval units after, like the ironclad. Yeah, the ironclad where, starts using coal, but then as soon as you basically get into the modern era when oil's available, pretty much and everything land is units, oil. it's tanks. And, mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. 
So there was a, uh, a tornado, a line of tornadoes moved through. I don't know if you caught that. Um, right, just north of our city, kind of on the border between our, our, our kingdom and, and Hungary there, which was kind of cool to see. Yeah, something about the history. It's like the tornado, I thought. I think a flood would have been more appropriate for a <laughs> for an for an Ottoman uh, yeah. invasion of in, in, for an Hungary. Ottoman invasion and going through history, it seemed like he was plagued by rains every time. I don't know if that was like a regional thing or just bad luck, but uh, you know, uh, Carl Chat would like to point out to you that uh, Molly is actually friendly now. Um, if you wanted to to be friends with them, I was harassing Carl about keeping all those alliances going yesterday when we were testing it out as well because it is important. Um, alliances, yeah, are giving you um, favor per turn in Gathering Storm, which is hugely helpful. Yeah, so each time you can keep another alliance um, online or push your alliance up to the next level, you get another point of favor per turn from it. So it's. Um, Worthwhile investing in those alliances for sure. Yeah, I'm, when I was playing, I've I've only played one game as the Ottoman, and I, I did my big re early Renaissance, you know, expansion push, um, and then could not manage diplomatic blowback from that for the rest of the game. Actually, I, I ended up getting a lot of grievance from the AI um, from it for continuing to occupy my cities, which I had rightfully taken from them. Um, well, but, and, and just so people are aware of how that works, why don't we go ahead and talk about grievances a little bit. It's, I, I don't think we focused on them in a recent live stream. So if we pull up Matthias's uh, diplomatic Ooh. record. Ooh, we got our Corsair. We'll That's have to. Nice. Yeah. Yes. Um, so if we pull that up, we can see there's a grievance log. And right now, the, the first major diplomatic incident between our two nations was the, their surprise war declaration. Correct. Because it was a surprise war declaration rather than a formal war, it's 150 grievances instead of just 100. So that's probably worth two, maybe even three border cities that we can go ahead and conquer from him without the world community <laughs> getting upset. So I don't know if you were doing that in your Ottoman game. Maybe you were just uh, uh, attacking on your own. Uh, you but know, this is this is the you know, Matthias I felt I was justified. offered us a great situation here because he initiated the attack, mm -hmm. and we were pretty maybe not 100 percent ready for it, but at yeah. least 75, 80 percent ready for it. So sorry, real quick, let's do a coastal raid uh, and see if we can pillage some stuff here. So we, we got some... received 66 science. Yep. And notice that did not take us any movement points, so we can also attack with the Barbary Corsair in the same move. It's, it's awesome. Yeah, <laughs> those guys awesome. are phenomenal. So um, we talked a little bit about how pillaging had changed in right. Gathering Storm in the last stream, and I noticed uh, a couple days later that the forums were, oh my god, pillaging is going to be a dominant strategy in Gathering Storm. This is crazily unbalanced. Um, and so just to be sure, I went ahead and I double-checked that two days ago and went through all the numbers again. Mm -hmm. And one key thing to, to note is that if you look at um, the way tech co um, costs scale through our game, right. they go up by a factor of about 20 or 25 through the, through the course of the game. So, okay. so uh, a technology that's maybe only a cost about 100 in the ancient era is up to the 2,500, somewhere in that range by the right. end of our game. Um, so that um, 25 times scaling is not how steep the scaling is for what we're doing with the pillaging. So the pillaging only goes up by about a factor of 10 okay. during the game. So even though it's much better than it used to be prior to Gathering Storm, where um, it was just, just a flat, flat amount yep. and it never went up, um, it's going to scale now, so it's going to feel a lot better, but it's not going to actually keep pace with um, the, the costs of technology or culture. So I think I misspoke a little bit last week. So I was talking about we were sort of aiming for if you you know, pillage something and got a quarter or a fifth of a technology that would be relatively constant throughout the game. Right. That's actually not the way the math's gonna work. It's gonna be a little bit less good than that as you go through errors. And so that quarter or fifth of a technology that you get early in the game might only be, you know, a sixth or an eighth or something like as that by a later tenth in the game. By the yeah. time you're, yeah, okay. Right. All right. So Carl looks like he's doing pretty well on this front. Um, so uh, we have a question about the color schemes, uh, the, the kind of the jersey system that we went to in this. Uh, so, for example, in this game, 
Um, you want to talk about Canada's color choice right. here. So Canada is typically, um, and if you select Canada Play, it, the game will make it um, a white background color with, with red text or, or primary color for, right. the, for the unit flags and symbols. Uh, but the Ottomans are too close to that. Yes. Because we have a primary, you know, white background field with green lettering on top of it. If we didn't want to have, like at the minimap would look like a mess if there was Canada right next to the Ottomans. Yeah, it'd be hard to both read. had that white background color. So the uh, Canadians, since they're not the Civ that you have selected to play as a human, have been pushed to one of their... Their secondaries, yeah. Yeah, yeah alternate they're, jerseys. They're away jerseys. Right. So yeah, the Canadians are away <laughs> here and we're the home team. <laughs> so, um, and then, actually, Carl, after you finish uh, nuking those guys on shore, uh, people have asked to see Akkad's uh, bonuses, if you want to pull them up for a second, what they're providing. So this is a militaristic city-state. Yep. Okay. And it sort of is the bypass, the battering ram and um, yeah. uh, siege tower kind of. Uh, if you've got them allied, you can kind of skip that. Gotcha. Um, Will you be able to pick your away jersey uh, as a home color when you're starting a game? Yeah. So you can't do that. Yeah. Okay. That's in the, the, the new setup screen. And if you're playing multiplayer, you know everyone can tune, and you can pick the pick everybody can argue be France, in the lobby, <laughs> and all of their cities can be named Paris. <laughs> but you'll be able to tell the difference. Okay, so it is a Buddha. It looks like we're going after here. And it's going to be interesting to see whether Carl thinks he can just, you know, bring it right down without having to besiege it first, or whether he's going to go and try to. Uh, get military units on the back side of it, get it fully besieged. Sorry, I got a Sweden-related question. Is the favor gained by Sweden for earning great people going to scale with game speed? It does not. It does not. I didn't think it um, A lot of the one-shots of favor are sort of part of the turn-by-turn -turn flow of things. Mm -hmm. Um, it's not something that takes a while to build up, so things like um, uh, favor from things that promising, uh, those kind of things. Um, you know, if you're playing a longer game, you're going to get more instances of those, so we, we decided not to scale that one up. It's got a lot of military units. There's a lot of Black Army coming down, quite a few Knight units coming down. Yeah, it's going to be a little tricky to get the zone of control on all the hexes on the other side of the river there in order to set up a siege. Be nice to get it, though. Um, so I got a question about uh, another Cyrus question. So we had one that was asked before the stream started, but um, do the changes to grievances affect Cyrus's leader ability to reduce the warmonger penalty from surprise wars? Okay, that's a great question. And it's been a couple months since I implemented the changes here. So think back, cast your yeah. mind back. So I'm gonna, um, don't quote me on this precisely, but it affects both Cyrus and Alexander have, um, now I believe it's, it's and, and Gorgo's involved here as well. Yeah. I believe it was Alexander and Gorgo had leader agendas where they, um, typically wanted you to be at war, and right. so they did not mind your warmongering. Right. So I'm pretty sure it was those two leaders that I set it up so that grievances decay twice as fast Okay. Um, with them, um, but I don't remember anything specific about Cyrus being done at the same time. Okay. I do know that, I mean, we underwent changes with with them, you know, basically trying to model it to the new system, so... Right, so that was basically what the effect but was. That it's it's interesting because, like, a lot of times when we... With iterative design, yeah. you you might lose touch or somebody might have... Another designer might have taken on that task and you, you forget where we ended up on that one, you know? And right. so it's like you have to kind of go back and remind yourself. So. But I, I know that the basic idea was that those leaders that feel like... Um, you know, war is more of a normal state of being and they respect you for it and so forth, that the way that that works in the new grievance system is they forgive grievances faster. Right. Carl, you're not pillaging the whales. You're managing to only hurt humans this time and not all life, <laughs> oh, as you're typically inclined went. to do. <laughs> um, no, I'm just giving Carl a hard time. Never Carl, have you been naming your units? We were giving you a hard time about that. 
Yeah, you have to. The storm, storm dogs. dogs. That's right. There we go. That's Good. Right. Thank Do you. Do you actually like choose names for your units? I, the first gunners. You mean you just accept? Oh the yeah. First I mean, unless it's like, unless it's like really nah. Um, Something else people might not know is you can actually just go in and type whatever you want in there. Yeah, too. but what's yeah. the fun? The game does a better job. Well, and I kind of the military units you don't have to name, but one of my favorite changes for the rock band is. When you have a rock band, it has to be named. Yes, yeah. It will not perform. There's actually grayed out text, will not perform until you give it a suitable name. Nice. Two more questions about grievances. Do they have any effect in multiplayer? Um, so um, we are working on some things with grievances um, so that they do have effect on human players. But one thing that we put in very recently is um, the way that the loyalty hit when you take a city worked is it used to be a flat um, penalty for occupying a city. Mm -hmm. And now that one scales based on how many grievances you have with uh, the player. Mm -hmm. So it's definitely an area we're looking at trying to integrate grievances so that they have um, sort of effects not just in terms of diplomatic relationship, but elsewhere in the game, and that's the one example we have of that right now. Gotcha. And there's no limit on the number of grievances you can well, generate. Well, it actually is much um, friendlier than the warmongering system in terms of, um, the warmongering system just could go out of hand. And if you just kept conquering things over and over again, you would get hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of negative diplomatic modifiers. It was the price of doing business. Right. It so was, yeah, the I called it the Roman tax. There, there is no limit to how many grievances you can rack up, mm -hmm. but the way it gets converted to diplomatic modifiers, there is a, a, a maximum. So people can hate you for being a warmonger only so much. At some point, they're just like, yeah, You cannot but, frustrate them anymore. Right, right. so, um, I think we've played with those numbers a little bit, but I think it was like between um, you directly warmongering against that person and then also the third party effects, you could get maybe about a minus 100 diplomatic modifier, but it doesn't gotcha. go nearly as high as it used to. So Suleiman had quite the interesting life, obviously, and he wasn't called Suleiman the Magnificent for nothing. And so this is, this is interesting here. I mean, obviously we've, kind of set the stage with Hungary. Um, but, uh, you know, that was one of his first conquests um, as, you know, as a, as a leader. And so it's interesting watching how this plays out. Plays out. And we'll see the, if- the, uh, the only thing I kind of wish was I wish the Valletta city-state was in here mm -hmm, so yep. that he would have to fight the Hungarians and the, the, the Knights, Knights of St. John, the Knights Hospitaller. At, yeah. At the same time, uh, so, since that's sort of how he opened his campaign once he took over as Sultan. So you want to just tell that story real quick while Carl lays siege to Miss Kolsch? Okay, so um, not only did he have to fight the Knights of St. John once on the um, island of Rhodes. On Rhodes, right. Because they were just interdicting all the Ottoman shipping on the eastern Mediterranean. Uh, but once he finally got them to capitulate, he thought they had fought so honorably that he let them um, leave with all their possessions and so forth. And they set up shop yet again on Malta. Mm -hmm. And that's how they became, they, you know, the city of Valletta grew up, or, you know, being protected right. by, by right. those knights. And that's how we decided it was worthy of putting in as a city-state here. So, so that's why I was hoping Valletta would be in the game. Um, the other cool note about Valletta is um, I, I love its ability because it's one of the ways you can take faith and kind of take it oh, out yeah. of the religious game. Use it to build the walls, right. And, and you can use it in the uh, rest of the game. So it allows you to build all the city center buildings with faith. That's been its ability all the way along. Right. Um, and it's great for walls because you can instantly build walls. Typically walls have to be hard built. They can't be bought with gold. Right. This is a way to purchase them. But this way you can faith. purchase yep. them. Yep. Now what's really interesting in Gathering Storm is the flood barrier, which is your key thing to stop against climate change, is also a city city building. Mm -hmm. And so the, um, and it's also And we like also do walls. not allow you, we don't allow you to instantly purchase build those. Them. Yeah, purchase right. them. Right, they have to be built. Unless you go to Valletta and, and say, Valletta, Valletta, I want to be your suzerain because I know that you have a connection to a divine power that's going to help me get walls instantaneously. I believe yeah, I will so build these walls. That's the one way you can get flood, ball, flood barriers very, very quickly. Uh, have enough faith. Have Valletta as um, uh, you know your your faithful ally, and then go that route. 
That was something when I was I was reading up to on the uh, uh, the Knights Hospitaller and Valletta and the the forts that they built on both Rhodes and and, uh, and on Malta. And um, I was surprised to find out that a lot of the stone that they used in in uh, building up those fortifications was actually taken from the ruins of the mausoleum of uh, Holocarnassus. Yeah. So, um, which I just thought was cool because I mean that, obviously that's a wonder in this game and. Kind of makes me wish that, like that, that whole salvaged production thing. You know, get that going with, <laughs> to build Except up. It was your... finished. <laughs> so it was someone finished. beat you to the mausoleum, or beat the knights to it. <laughs> right, right. Mm -hmm. But they used that extra. Yeah, should production. that be an achievement? Yeah, we should write some crazy achievement like yeah. that, huh? Yeah. Uh, Carl, um, chat is going crazy to see uh, Reina, the financier, the governor's. Um, he was. Yeah, he was mousing over, the... over some of her abilities yeah. earlier. So I, I think we've we pretty well covered most of that. Unless somebody has a specific question, I, I think they're just interested in the suite of them. So if we have a if we, we have want a to moment, probably after get the, the screenshot of the whole screen, so yeah. we can document it that way. So what's our Barbary Corsair been up to? It's sort of languishing on the southern coast. I'm wondering if it has any targets further up the coast that we can hit. Yeah, right. Like I mean, they're Corsairs. They All need right. to be going harassing. They're Absolutely. very speedy wreaking ships. havoc. And it, yeah, I never they're getting get a they're getting bored there. There was a famous um, I'm trying to remember his name, like one Barbarossa. of the most Barbarossa. Barbarossa, that's right. So it was, it's interesting because one of the reasons we decided the Ottomans were so worthy to get the unique governor was they actually had three different historical candidates, even just within Suleiman's reign, right? For historical figures that would have made great, very interesting, unique governors. So, so for you moders out there, this is something you might want to. Right, Consider. or if, if everyone decides that you know, the mock community goes nuts and they want to add a unique governor to every sieve, well, mm -hmm. don't, Oof. don't. Have fun with that. Yeah, <laughs> have fun with it. But don't skimp on giving the Ottomans a second unique governor. There you go, they yeah. get two, yeah. Right. If they're the only one that so has one, Barbarossa was else. one of our candidates who's, who not only led the um, Corsair fleet for Suleiman, but also set up um, all his North African possessions and um, governed those provinces. Um, he actually was part of working with Ibrahim on alliances with the French. Right. And so what the, one of the coolest things in Ottoman history was they had such a tight alliance with the French that the French um, offered to house the entire Ottoman fleet in southern France along the Riviera for one winter. Yeah. And they just took over the town and it was just an Ottoman naval base for, for the time. So. Um, you know, the, the French got a lot of grief from the rest of Europe for how friendly they were with uh, the Ottomans, but, you know, I well. think it was the stage was all set with Ibrahim's diplomacy. So yep. uh, we felt like things like giving the bonus uh, for Ibrahim to allow an ally to get a production boost mm -hmm. was totally justifiable. Makes there sense. Was all sorts of Ottoman bombards and other military equipment that they lent to the French. Um, so, so we kind of felt like that was justifiable. Now, there's one very subtle thing Carl is doing here with his production. You'll notice that he's still got the option to build swordsmen despite us having uh, discovered gunpowder. And since he can't talk for your safety, um, I'm <laughs> going to tell you what he told us yesterday, <laughs> which was... Williams on our build list. He's, um, Sweet. He's been building swordsmen because he doesn't have enough niter on hand to outright build a janissary. So what he's doing is he's building swordsmen, and when he gets just enough uh, to promote or to upgrade one to Janissary, he does that. And then that allows him kind of the ability to take the cheaper to produce unit and then upgrade it using oh, various Molly tricks. Traders. Yeah. Um, four, four Molly traders coming across our empire at once. Money, All right, money, so let's money. focus on Abuda. We did not get in under siege, but we're still doing fine with our artillery and our genisseries. Yeah, the walls are almost down. Yeah. We're chipping away at that. Yeah, but we're going to lose. Uh, main so, health of the city. Um, the Ottoman Great Bombard ability, does that affect battering rams and siege towers as well too? Does that benefit those? No, because no, okay. they're not. No, those are support units and they work a little differently. It's okay. we, 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 we sort of have these two separate we always Liders. have to clarify when we talk about siege units in meetings and things like that because yep. there's basically two types. But this this is the type that's the military bombardment type of uh, like oh. catapults, bombards, etc. Well, it seems that oh, we denounced them. I didn't even notice Carl doing that. Well, nice. It's Philip. 
Yeah, it's very appropriate. It's also Carl. It's, fun, should it's be, fun to make We him should angry. be at war with speed. I have a feeling that if it's up to Carl, that will happen. So who was the other person that you were considering? So we've got Barbarossa. And then um, Suleiman's second wife, yep, Roxana, Roxana, was his clear favorite. She had huge influence in the Ottoman court. Yep. Um, she and Ibrahim ended up not really getting along. Um, and it was because she looked at him as a threat to uh, Suleiman's power that um, she finally convinced Suleiman that he had to... Uh, she managed to put a wedge between him and his best friend. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, it, so it's it, kind of a sad... It's kind of a sad, I, I look at tragic, a sad story tragic well. story. Although she, you know, was um, from the... Uh, I believe from the Caucasus region, and she was a very, you know... Um, interesting person in her own right. And so definitely also worthy of being a governor. Mm -hmm. um, and um, if you go to Istanbul, there are buildings and museums and mosques yep. na named after um, her and Ibrahim and plenty yep. for Suleiman, of Ibrahim's, course, as well. I mean, palace is still, and her palace are, are both still intact. Right. Oh, Pachkuti's mad at you because you're settling near mountains. <laughs> and those are his mountains everywhere in the world. <laughs> They're all, all, his mountains. They're my, all mountains. my mountains. Exactly. <laughs> I, I love the mountains here, though, because they gave us, I mean, just the campuses and the holy sites all have amazing like, holy. Can you make terrace farms? It's, it's no. just, it's, no. it's something no, I just no, love about the difference, I mean, about in, in Civ 6 is that, you know, obviously it was intentional that the terrain played more of a role in your gameplay. But I just I love the way the mountain ranges are are composed and how they how they work and and, and, and within we, the game and how players can use them to their we, advantage. We should have Carl especially with tunnels, up. kind of when we went over yeah, that actually, with that live know, stream. If you pan over to the Incan Empire, we can see that they have started putting in their mountain roads. The yeah, you can Kapak see that little Apak, uh, the icon for the Kapak Non right there. Yep, yep. So. Pachacuti's got it figured out how to get through those mountains. Yes. How many tiles can a canal traverse, and is there a limit on the types of naval units that can pass through a canal? Okay, there's no limit to the types yes. of naval units. Even aircraft carrier can sail through canals. They hold their breath. <laughs> <laughs> yep, real tight. Real tight. Um, like narrow thoughts. So, the the basic rule is canals have to be um, joining things on either side that are considered water tiles. Yes. Um, and a city center can act as a water tile, so you can hook up a city center through one land tile and, and then get that city out to the sea. Mm -hmm. But what you can't do is build sort of speculative canals across the land that aren't hooking into anything. Yes. Each time you build one, you have to have you know, connection points on either side of it as well. Um, and the only way you can cross something that's as large as like a, a three-tile gap is if you get the Panama Canal Wonder. Correct. Is it possible to send boats through tunnels and the Kapak Non? No. No. <laughs> can you enter? Creative idea. <laughs> yeah. But, but not possible. Good try. <laughs> yes. What was that? Uh, never mind. Never mind. The, the Golden Gate Bridge is interesting because it works as sort of a reverse canal because land units stay in their land form. They don't embark to go across it. So right. you're going across, you know, that's land units going across water just like naval units are going across. So we have finished researching banking. So we have access to the Grand Bazaar now. So right. we can start building that. This is uh, the can Ottomans. We purchase the Grand Bazaar? That might be a little too expensive. And we're not made of gold. Oh. Janissaries cost money. Uh, two turns, we can purchase one. Yeah. So, but this war is costing us a lot of money. So, but we're conquering Hungary finally. Yes. Yeah. You know, it's. I guess the you know Suleiman was able to at least make Hungary into a vassal state for a while. Oh yeah. But I uh, never made it to Vienna, which was his ultimate objective. So, um, you know, it's sort of a mixed bag in terms of his campaigns through Hungary. In the end, it all ends up being something about Austria and Hungary, right? <laughs> <laughs> that, was a, that was a joke in high school, was if you didn't know what to answer on the, uh, on the European history test, the answer was always the Austro-Hungarian Empire. Yes, was, uh, <laughs> exactly. 
Yeah, because they were kind of a thorn in his side. You know, he was looking for ways into Europe. He was oh, there, there we go. There All we go. those yeah. wonders are ours. Did we, we captured two, three wonders? It looks like the oracle was just outside the border. But yeah, we, we didn't get Anchor the oracle, Watt, but we got Anchor Watt needs a... needs a... Now, the city's not super thrilled about I think about. the Hanging Gardens is there to the east, too, as well. Oh, yeah, it is. Piper. Right. So where did we have Ibrahim at this point? We just took that city. So Ibrahim's been in This Amazia, would be the right time to move him To forward. move him to Abuja. Yeah. Uh, now we're, I think. Because he only takes three turns to reestablish himself, you know. Um, yeah, he's a fascist kind of, establisher like the Castellan. Right, that, that allows us to, you know, maybe we'll take a turn or two to regroup our military before we take the next city, or maybe not. It looks like Carl's going right for it, um, but. Maybe, yeah, he's just confident. But, you know, you get that extra. Get that extra bonus. So much pillaging. And he, oh, I, I love oh. the coastal raid ability to just take a snipe a barbarian camp right yeah. from the water. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. Boy, you guys took all that time positioning your units. That's the other thing. Sure would be a shame if somebody yeah, sniped out from underneath you. Just, right, just sending out, like, you know, sending out your units so that can pillage early. And you can also pick up goody huts. I don't mm -hmm. know if that's necessarily a well known strategy, but. I always use it when I'm playing Norway. Oh, yeah. And then, of course, you know, you can get the credit for clearing out barbarian camps on right. so there's remote islands scores, and things like that. Like that so the, those go toward your error score. So there's it's lots of different ways that helps you out. Yep. In, you know, in addition to the, the yields you get from it. He's still got so quite I think a few the cities one here. story we haven't told from our Ottoman story Story um, Ottoman story hour. Our yeah. story hour is. Um, oh, we. Oh, is he negotiating for peace? peace? Yeah, Carl's not going to refuse. Get peace. See, yeah. because that's talking about the Ottoman. See, like you know, when he would when he would let peace happen or he'd let people go free, it always came back to bite him later. You know, when he when he let the the the, the remnants of the knights' okay, so hospitality go away. This is interesting. Go we away. Go through a little. Um, oh yeah. Carefully through this. Sure, so sure. because of our conquests. Um, finally, the world has noticed that we're going on a bit of a rampage here. Uh, and so a military Carl. emergency is being uh, proposed against us. Mm -hmm. And we're not the strongest diplomatic player. You know, we've, like we were encouraging Carl to keep those alliances healthy so we could get as much favor as possible. But it looks like uh, there are at least four other nations that have more favor than we do. So um, I think Carl put it, put go all in on this one to try to block it. Yeah, because uh, you really don't want... Okay, so we'll put four votes in to block it, um, because otherwise everyone that joins us is at war with us. So let's see how this comes out. A volcano. <laughs> I'm sure this is fine. We no, turned, not it's gnomen. turned all the way up. It's, it's, it's yeah, not but the World Congress session was a little explosive this yeah, time, mm -hmm. I think. I'm sure it does. Contentious <laughs> diplomacy. Frank and open. And it passed against us. Oh, boy. Us. Oh, boy. So Pachacuti... Matthias and Laurier, and Laurier always likes to join emergencies. He does, that's, yeah, that's so we should have known that he would have so, um, so they're going to be at war with us. So luckily they're all in the same direction, I believe. We just keep going north, right? Yeah, well. So, and we had not played this out ahead of time. We had no idea that this was going to No, no, this, is, this, so this is, is one of the beauties is territory. that the games start to diverge over time, yeah. so... Uh, so. Carl, when you have a second, we'll check the score to see how much we've uh, we've dinged into uh, Hungary's lead here. Oh. Mm, took a little bite out of right, him. He's yeah. definitely not twice us anymore. Right. Yeah. So we're we're, we're we've gone right a lot further and than look, he's gone the back. The three guys that declared against us are on the leaderboard ahead of us. So, they, so those are sort of the ones we want to be fighting as well. Right, right. It's just, is it going to be a problem if they combine they forces? They will serve only to enrich our legend. <laughs> So anyways, our last Ottoman story, I'm just going to tell people to look it up. Sure. Look up the story of Julia Gonzaga. Because that also is a Barbarossa story. That's a Barbarossa story. Oh, it's right. It's an Ibrahim yeah, okay. story. Yep. It's a Roxolana story. I'm remembering story. this one now. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And um, it, it's very tied in with the Barbary Corsairs. Um, it's a very dramatic story. Um, it was an attempt by Ibrahim to kind of improve his position um, by... Swiping right. By... by 
um, getting Suleiman interested in a different woman than Roxolana. So it's definitely worth um, worth a read. Yeah, it's a, it's a good story. Yeah, there were definitely some maneuvering and some competition between those two. There always is for, in the Ottoman uh, mm -hmm. Empire, and you know, the worst thing to be is one of the sons that's not chosen to uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. be next in line. Yeah, it was it was rough. It was rough. So it looks like we're going to be able to hold on to a Buddha pretty well, actually. And there's nobody. I mean, I don't see any armies immediately coming in w with those mountains to protect us. Our new conquests are going to be able to hold. We could condemn the Incan um, religious units that are coming towards us now, too. Oh, that'll be fun. Oh, I, I believe it was a cultural alliance that Carl made with Christina. Yes. So she's not going to jump in to fight for us, I don't believe. Nope. And an economic one with, uh, with Mansa okay. Musa. And he's but better, better to at least have them in an alliance than joining the rest of the world. Yeah, and, yeah. and, that and is, hating us for their and, and conquest. And people kind of, if, if you decompose what happened to that World Congress session, you know, because we'd gone to the trouble to either declare friends like we did with Coupe right. or um, set up alliances with those other leaders, then when that emergency kicked in, it was yeah. everyone else joined it, but we at least had a few people that were willing to back us. And there was no they would have lost more by joining that emergency. They would have lost out on the advantage of, of joining the alliance and for the, for the dubious and it's, opportunity the AI to is win. just, you know, we, we have spent a fair amount of time, we're continuing to improve it, but we spent a lot of time trying to make sure that the AI is voting in a very rational way at these World Congress sessions, and um, because that's sort of an important part of getting the World Congress the right feel. Um, so there are a lot of routines that run to evaluate in this particular situation what makes sense for this AI to be considering. So we only have to hold out for, ooh, drought. No, that's not good. And pillaged, uh, pillaged one of our paddocks and one of our farms, it looks like. And that is an area of an empire that sort of doesn't have much vegetation. So yep. it's the kind of thing that is going to get hit with drought. Yep. And we only have to hold out for 23 more turns, which I... I put war in Carl's capable hands. Um, 23 more turns until? Until the military emergency expires. Oh. <laughs> and then, uh, well, not the end of the stream, unfortunately. Yeah, I was about to We say. all have to go back to work. <laughs> We're not going to be able to play 23 <laughs> turns out. It looks like a fun 23 yeah, turns, gonna, right? Yeah, it's going to be It's going to be a good one to try to keep. And notice um, Buda itself, the Hungarian capital, is not following Islam yet. So that's why Carl is... We're working on that right yeah, now. Yeah, he's got yeah. a um, joint military religious force all trying to work on bringing that one down. So uh, how does joining emergencies affect the grievance system? So will joining an emergency generate grievances against another player? It does not. It does not. Treatment. Okay, because it's sanctioned by the world. It's right. a World Congress. Okay. Um, are the World Congress resolutions era-specific? Uh, can we choose which ones pop up? They're random in terms of which ones come up, but and there are specific ones that are tied to they're specific They're constrained by era. It's very similar to what people would be used to from Rise and Fall's um, dedication system. Okay. So... You know, each of those different dedications typically has two or three eras that it's allowed to come up with that, mm -hmm. um, that makes sense historically. And the resolutions work the same way. You know, it, now that we have nine eras, I think probably most of them span maybe three or four eras. Okay. And I think um, the dedications might be a little bit more than two or three for some of them. Um, but you don't have like climate accords in the Middle Ages. Right. Um, it's, it's more of a. What, what's what's appropriate for the age that you're in right. at that point as it, far as So we looked at each benefits. one and then we then we kind of made um, Carbon dioxide call hasn't been invented yet. <laughs> um, <laughs> don't at me. I know. <laughs> it was a joke. Uh, people want to know if they can mod their own governors in. Yes. Oh, absolutely. It's, that functionality has always been in since we introduced them. Um, but, I mean, I've said it before, but we always... But I, try I to take you, us. You can improve that a little bit with you, unique. Governors. Right, we've there we've extended. Some... Right, we've extended that with unique governors. Um, yeah, when when um, uh, Rise and Fall first came out, um, it was kind of a basic implementation. The the uh, the promotions were very specific to each leader, um, or I mean, for, to each governor. And so 
Um, but we made that so that you can come up with your own promotion trees. They can be linked to, you can make a promotion collection. You can mix and match them all you want. They're, they're, so the, the modability of governors across the board, um, and it, it should be fairly easy to mod them as well. I mean, it's um, hmm. all in data changes and things like that. Very, very little of it is completely hard coded. Hachikuti, the earth shaker, he's making the earth shake in his empire. Did you see that? No, I didn't. What happened? Volcanic eruption. Ooh. Uh, will a volcanic eruption stack with a river flood? It will, won't it? Um, it does not, actually. Oh. Because it starts to become like, what did this come from in terms of their fertility? So the way it works is the volcanoes get placed down first, I believe, and then and all the non-impassable tiles around the volcano get marked as volcanic targets. Mm -hmm. um, and then when I'm going through and marking all the floodplains, um, I'm looking for a river that has four to ten um, passable, passable, not hilly um, tiles. And if if I find that, that becomes a floodplain. Okay. Um, but the volcanic target tiles are excluded from the floodplains. Now, the only exception to that is we just added the capability for if you turn the disaster setting up to to level three or to level four, mm -hmm. um, volcanoes can strike tiles in terms of do, dealing damage two tiles away, um, and that can hit your floodplain tiles. So tiles can take damage from, from both a flood and a volcano if you have that setting, if the, the um, disaster intensity slider is set up to a three or a four. Gotcha. Where in the tech tree does the Barbary Corsair unlock? People have asked. Well, we'll let Carl show that, because that's a good question. It's. Um, sort of on the same direction as going to Privateer. It's just a little bit earlier. Happens earlier, yep. Okay, so here they Keep are at uh, stop, Medieval stop Fairs. Medieval Fairs. And it's two um, technologies, or two civics later. Mercantilism is when the mm -hmm. Privateer would normally come, would normally come on. Okay. Um, the Corsairs, they taught pirates how to pirate, right? They, yeah. It was, you know, <laughs> legally, it's well, privateering. The crazy, thing the, about the, pirates. Sanctioned. the crazy thing about the Barbary Corsairs is they were still a thorn in the side of the United States when the United States was first um, putting a navy up. Yeah, it was necessary to go from the halls of Montezuma the, to the shores, shores of, of Tripoli. Tripoli. Yeah. yeah, that's against okay. the Barbary Okay, I did not know Corsairs. that. Yeah, yep. That's so, very yep. interesting. So they were Yeah, you've active. done you've done some studying uh, up on the Corsairs, haven't you? We, we have a few books on the Barbary Corsairs. Okay, cool. To be yeah. fair, they're fun reads. Yeah. Um, there was a question about how war weariness and um, grievances interact with each other. Um, okay, so it's similar to the previous system that based on the casus belli you have for the war, right? that's gonna be sort of a, um, like either a multiplier, if it's a case of a surprise war, or a, you know, decelerator in the case of you have a really good casus belli. So um, when you go into a war, uh, what you do, the, the grievances will be um, adjusted based on the casus belli, mm -hmm. and that's also true of the war weariness that's picked up. So war weariness is much more a factor of how the combat's going, are you winning the combat, um, you know, ha how many times have you had units killed, those kind of things. Um, but then those are all accelerated or decelerated by the Casus Belli. So your people are tolerant of more losses in a, mil in a, in a war that they feel is justified. Mm -hmm. um, but if the Casus Belli wasn't there, then they're going to get um, tired of the war sooner. So they are definitely related, but it's not like a grievance causes a war weariness point or anything like that. You know who never wearies of war? I'm waiting for this one. Carl. <laughs> That's that true. guy. He just, he just he denied just, another like peace offering. another hour, right? Yeah, I want like, to complete I just the wanna, conquest. Yeah, no, we're going to have to leave that on that note. Unfortunately, uh, we're going to leave Matthias uh, shaking his fist in impotent rage as Carl continues to conquer his kingdoms and as we attempt to bide our way through the military emergencies. So that's been a look at the Ottoman, this uh, incredible Renaissance-era military conquest powerhouse uh, to look at the abilities that they bring. So don't forget, Civilization VI Gathering Storm is coming out on February 14th, just a little over two weeks from now. That's very exciting for us here. Hope you've enjoyed this first look at uh, this new Civ, and uh, stay tuned. Look for us on Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, your other favorite social media sites, and uh, for more news on Gathering Storm. Thanks for watching today.